Good morning, all. Uh, my name is Ankush Mehra, and thanks a lot for us uh, coming down to uh, attend our webinar on Zebra uh, services, data services. Um, please allow me to uh, hand over the mic to Nicholas uh, Croft, who is a senior uh, retail account manager. And over to Nicholas. Thank you. Yes, thanks, Ankush, and a good morning to everybody. And um... As Uncle uh, said, uh, today we'll be discussing is why the blockchain for traceability. I'm going to start off the webinar. Next slide, please, Uncle. Yeah, Thank you. I just want to start off the webinar with introducing our speakers today. Um, we start off with Alex Fry, which is our MIA regional product manager, based in the UK. And uh, Alex is going to speak today about uh, blockchain with Zebra. And then we've got myself, Nicholas Ford, uh, Senior Account Manager for Zebra Technologies based in Cape Town, South Africa. Um, so I've invited both Alex and Jens to come and speak to our local market as um, I actually joined one of their webinars the other day. And I think there's great value with blockchain and, tra and uh, for traceability in different verticals. And uh, I wanted them to share with our local guys in South Africa and as well as in Africa, as uh, what they've done and the tools that they've got um, for our party community to use. And with that, I also want to introduce Jens uh, Lant Nielsen. He's the head of global trade and supply chain for IOTA Foundation. And so Jens is going to speak about uh, blockchain, blockchain technology, and also going to discuss the use case of how it's being used. So a big welcome to Jens as well. And then last but not least, we've got Marco Politi. So Marco is uh, our ISV champion for the South region. And uh, if you're not, if you don't know about our ISV program, please reach out to um, Marco after the slides. And uh, Marco will also spend a couple of minutes just speaking about the benefits of our ISV program. So before we get started, I just thought I'd uh, have one or two slides about Zebra Technologies. So next slide, please, Ankush. So if you look at Zebra last year, we celebrated our 50 year um, so we actually started back in 1969, same year as the uh, moon landing. So I think over the last couple of years, we had a lot of different milestones from our first uh, laser barcode scanner to first barcode printer, our first EDA, um, I think wearable technology back in 1997, um, first RFID mobile printer. So I think if you look back in the last 10 years, I think we've had a big I won't say shift, but a big um, focus on software and software tools. With uh, back in 2013, when we launched um, our own operating system called Linker into our printer community. In the same year, we um, also launched our first IoT platform, which we called um, Zetar. Um, we actually relaunched that platform back in 2018. Um, and I think that's what we're going to discuss today, where Alex is going to spend a bit more time on. Um, and different APRs and everything that's available on Savannah. And uh, another one that I want to touch on really is Profitect. Um, Profitect today is better known as Zebra Prescriptive Analytics. Uh, it's renamed, and I think the name Zebra Prescriptive Analytics gives you a bit more information as to what the product is used for. Basically, looking at your data in your business and based on what your data's behavior is, you can actually. Um, react to that data, what it's telling you in real time, and actually build a workflow um, to actually send one of your employees to that um, point to go and investigate and actually put a response back into the system and then utilizing different technologies like machine learning, and AI, uh, to build better insights into your business. If you want some more information on Profitect, um, or let me just rephrase Zebra Prescriptive Analytics, uh, please reach out to myself. We'd we'll be happy to put you in touch with uh, the team. It's a very, very nice and exciting product. I think if you look over the last 50 years, I can uh, actually spend a lot of time on the slide, uh, but I think it gives you a good understanding as to uh, where Zebra has come from. And uh, I'm actually very excited about the next 50 years going forward. So with that, Ankush, can you just please uh, go to the next slide? So just a quick um, spotlight as Zebra as a company. I know that uh, on the call, we've got some existing partners. We've also got some new guys. So just for the new guys, Zebra is a global company with under over 115 offices all over the world. 
But if you ask me, uh, for me, the biggest asset on this um, slide here is the fact that we got more than 10,000 um, channel partners and ISV, uh, ISV partners all over the world. And this is in different verticals, you know, across verticals and different areas within those verticals. So it's the success of our partners that really is the reason for the success of Zebra. Um, and I think if you look at the next fact on this uh, sheet, which is 4,200 patents or US and international patents, um, you can see that we're an innovation company. I've actually done a quick calculation uh, the other day. If you, if you look back, we've been in business for 50 years and if you take 4,200 uh, patents, it gives you an average of more than one patent per week since the year that we started. That, that really proves that Zebra is an innovation company. And the reason why we're able to do that is the fact that we invest um, or we make a huge invest, investment in research and development. Um, like I said, it's twice the size of our nearest competitor. Because I believe if you want to stay market leaders, you need to keep investing um, into your products, both hardware and software, so that we can have a reliable product and all the different tools and tool sets for our party community to enable them to bring more solutions to the market. And I think today is testament of uh, what we're trying to accomplish, um, bringing our party communities, our software community together and to share information of successes and opportunities in the market. So with that, um, you know, like I said, just a quick introduction, a quick spotlight on Zebra. Um, I would like to hand over to uh, Jens to take us through why the blockchain for traceability. Thank you, Jens. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, yeah, and thank you for the invitation, invitation here. I'm really excited to, to, uh, to talk and discuss this topic with you today. Um, so just a, a little bit of background. Um, my background before I joined the IOTA Foundation was I worked for, for Maersk, the shipping company, uh, for many years. And before that, also consultancies and, and different digital uh, business models. Um, uh, so today I work for the IOTA Foundation where I head up our work around the trade and, and supply chains. And uh, very briefly about uh, the IOTA Foundation, it's, um, it's a non-for-profit foundation. Um, we were registered uh, just in 2017, but actually the work on the, on the technology started in 13 by our founders. So in that respect, we are almost uh, six, seven years old, which is of course not a lot. But in the in blockchain, it is quite quite many years. Um, we are registered in Germany, and uh, we are one of the leading organizations on research and development of of distributed ledger technologies or, or blockchain technologies. Um, the technology we develop is is an open source technology, and uh, and you can actually access it uh, through through our website and GitHub's, and you can find different libraries and JavaScript and C plus and Rust and so forth. Um, so today, I, um, I've had the pleasure of, uh, I have 20 minutes to, to talk about why we would use uh, this technology for track and trace. Um, and my aim is actually that even if you don't have any prior knowledge about blockchain also to make sure you leave the room with some understanding of what this technology can do. And then of course, an understanding of why that is relevant uh, to supply chains. Um, I will then hand over to, to Alex and, and Nick again from CEPRO to cover more, you know, the, what we think is very exciting, how, how it's becoming a much more ready and easy accessible technology through, through, through our partnership with, the, with CEPRO so it can be used in supply chains. So uh, next slide. Um, so when you talk about um, supply chains, how I normally think about supply chains, if you know, you need to explain some outsiders that is actually, you know, quite a number of different uh, actors that that cuts out the supply chain from the producer, manufacturers, and and the transporters, and the warehouses, and and the, and the government agencies when you have to take to trade across borders and so on. And what is really uh, interesting and uh, fr frustrating is that you can think about it as, as a set of black boxes. That means that you know, each actor don't have visibility all through the supply chain, but only you know, see 
upwards and downwards, maybe one actor and then everything else is kind of a black box of, of what happens to a parcel or, or a consignment. Um, and often information, you know, they, they're shared on emails, they're shared on, 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 on physical manual documents or, or people will rekey information into new systems and with the laws that you might have of, of, of uh, the failure or the loss of data that happens. Um, so, so when you look at the whole supply chain from a holistic overview, what is there's something you know missing to coordinate, and the coordination can be very very difficult. Um, and I, I I'm showcasing here a few products. Uh, you know whether it's a T-shirt or it's a spare part from machines or it's coffee. Um, why is it that we want uh, have bigger track and trace and 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 we see a number of good reasons for that and maybe some of these reasons echo with you out there um, but you know the the better coordination and planning is really a time and cost saver you know the just in time or for recalls or or for predictions um, is, is uh, where you know where are the goods at this point are they closing up on on, on, on the role that you have in the supply chain uh, and so forth. Um, but it could also be to have access to specific data about an item. Let's say you want to know uh, what is the, uh, the, the origin uh, produced uh, data for, for an item uh, because there are many preferential trade agreements and if you know the origin is important for the tax that you have to declare. Um, with end consumers it's really you know, the, the product, product provenance, where does it come from, uh, the ethical trading schemes that it's, it's part of, and you can, you can have that traceability back. Or it could be things like product authenticity. Can we, um, you know, whether we're talking wine or olive oil or luxury goods or spare parts for cars or whatever we talk about, there's a lot of fake products out there and, uh, and, and, uh, and we need a way to, to, to make sure product are authentic. But to get there, there are some missing pieces. And, 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 and Krish, would you go next? Thank you. Uh, so some of the missing pieces that, that we need to do this is we need to take any physical product or consignment or whatever and have a physical to digital link. Um, what I mean by this is you need somehow to to establish what we call a digital twin. So you have a representation digitally of a product that we can start to collaborate and, 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 and work around. And there we need, you know, RFID or barcodes or other ways of, of, of tagging products. So that's the first step we need. Um, then we need actually that, you know, data is, is you can trace it back to its source so that Every, when everybody is starting to, to share data around this digital twin, that we, uh, we have accountability for this data, that who uploaded the data, um, and, uh, and, and, and we, can, we can find that audit trail. And the last thing we need from accountability of the data that goes in around such a digital twin is we need to know that the data when it goes in is immutable. So people can't later change that data. Nobody can get in and, and manipulate that data. So we have this immutability um, support. And blockchain is really the supporting uh, technology that can, that can help realizing these, these, um, these, these missing pieces. Um, so before we get into how we applied it, a little quick introduction to what blockchain is. And Chris, next slide. So what is blockchain? Well, um, traditionally, this is how we, we've been handling data. Um, we have a, a, a central ledger and, uh, and often this central ledger is, you know, either a government or in the financial system, a bank. And they, they are the one who records all the data. You know, they keep one ledger of how much money I spent uh, with, 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 they keep the ledger for me, but also when I, I, I pay somebody else uh, with my credit card and so on, the ledger stays with the bank. And so they have the trusted the, the, the data source. And this is a centralized approach where they, they have access to, of course, also everything. And, and the whole trust is given to this central identity to keep the ledger intact. 
but the, 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 the innovation here, if you go to next, um, is, is that we, um, we can distribute that. Information is now distributed. So instead of one entity keeping that ledger, let's say we have a multiple number of entities keeping a ledger. So when I, if I pay Alex $10, uh, everybody will take a note and say, you know, Jens paid Alex $10. Um, he gave, he gave me $3 back. Everybody will tell you no, $3 back. And then we'll ask the status and the status is that he still owes me $7. But the truth here is what does everybody agree? So it's consensus. Everybody runs the ledger and if 51% agrees that Alex owes me still $7, well, the truth is this consensus. That means you start to have a distributed, um, uh, way of, of handing that data and it's, uh, it's less prone to, to mistakes and there's nobody who can, it's less prone to, to attacks because you need to, if a lot of people or a lot of entity and nodes are, are keeping this data, you actually need to hack a lot of servers um, to change this consensus. And what even makes it stronger is that in, in why it's called blockchain is you have these blocks where you keep all that data for a period of time and you form a block and then there will be a period of time a new block will be formed. So if you say next here, you actually have a number of blocks where the next block not only takes the new data in, but it also take a, a fingerprint of the, the previous block. A fingerprint is a unique identifier of the whole block and what data there was in it. So you then have in the next block also a representation of the block before it, plus the new data. So you, and then you start to have blocks on a chain. That's why it's called blockchain. But the, the, the mutability comes from, let's say seven blocks later in time, uh, somebody wants to try to manipulate uh, earlier data. Not only do they need to go in and convince all these different um, nodes that something should be changed to need to change the consensus. They also need to change all previous transactions who have referenced this fingerprint of this block. And there comes becomes, you know, that, that the immutability of this data and why that it's very, 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 very hard. I would say almost impossible to go in and, and, and change, you know, any data record and, and extremely costly if you want to do that. So this is a, this is the this is the technical explanation of 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 it, and why what you get out is the data trust. Um, so if any supply chain event is uploaded, you can store, let's say, the time and the date and the info about what happened and the who, and then you can ensure the data integrity and the accountability of who uploaded at what time. Um, and, and, and what you can actually also, and to add some more technology to this, is you can add encryption of the data. So not only do you get the, the immutability, but you can also encrypt it in a way that you can decide who has access to this. So you can start to do permissions on who can actually see this data. You don't maybe want to share, you know, that all data around all trades in the world with everybody who can access the ledger, right? Um, so you can start to, to, to build this kind of, of systems around it. And, uh, and that is an important feature when we start to design supply chain use cases. Um, but the thing is the blockchain has some limitations. And if you go to the next slide, there's a reason why I normally don't refer to this technology anymore, um, it, but I start to refer to it as distributed ledger technologies. And, and, and some of the key things is that because we have blocks on a data on a chain, there's only that much information that can be included into one block because all the system at the same time, all the nodes, all the savers around the world has to keep all that information and agree in a consensus in these blocks. Um, and there's a latency in, in systems, how they can share information uh, across the world with all these nodes. So it gives us some scalability problems. So if you know, if you, you know, Bitcoin, the underlying blockchain on the Bitcoin can do around seven transactions per second. And if you take uh, Ethereum, they can do around 15 transactions per second. Um, and then there is, you know, newer ways of organizing, um, or organizing these, uh, these uh, protocols. Um, 
And, and, and another thing about blockchain is that to have all these nodes running around the world, you need what is called miners who actually is performing an important job um keeping the, the all these ledgers and but you have to pay them for this so there's some kind of fee or it's called gas in some systems um so you actually have you know the users of the system if you have the miners and that you have some conflicting interest because one wants to see the fee go up the other ones wants the data as cheap as possible so in many ways um the traditional blockchain um, is maybe not very fitted for supply chain when you have so many uh, transactions that needs to go in. Um, so from the tangle, we solve this with simply using another data structure. Uh, we don't have blocks and there's no chain. Uh, so it's not really a blockchain. Uh, we call it distributed ledger technology. Um, and it works a little bit similar in the way it's, it's a funny little illustration I have here, um, but if you imagine from the right, a new transaction coming, one of these purples, what it would do is every time a new transaction comes in, it will reference, points out two former transactions, including like in a block, having the, 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 the hash or the fingerprint of what happened in that transaction. And then new transaction will come in and reference two others. Um, but those two others that are referenced, will always be chosen by a mathematical random walk, it's called, so it's unpredictable. And, and, and as more transaction comes in, uh, all transactions will somehow be linked to each other and reference each other, but not in, in, in the block with everybody having all the, all transactions that reference everything, but some, you know, it's only two reference to others and so on. And mathematically, what we get is exactly the same, um, data trust, but we get some other benefits. And some of the other benefits is that, um, first of all, um, you, you don't have miners because when you put a transaction in this system, you help validating two other transactions to pointing at them. So every user is also in that respect, performs a, 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 the same role as a miner will do in, in, noble, uh, in normal blockchain. Uh, so we don't have miners and therefore there's no fees. Um, it, all transactions are fee-less. That doesn't mean you have some infrastructure cost. You have to have a, a node running and it will perform a little bit of CPU power. Um, but, but we're talking at a whole lot of scale here. Um, that also means that you don't need any tokens or you, know, you don't need the IOTA token or any other token um, to pay anyone and therefore just basically things, you know, like the legal status of cryptocurrencies are still evolving, um, but, but you can actually use this technology here without having tokens. Um, so there's no regulatory compliance issues because you don't have to own it. You just need to run a node uh, to do this. Um, and secondly, then the model scales better um, because each transaction will reference to others. Um, you start to have the scaling power and, uh, and, uh, and, and our recent test, we actually ran a, a thousand transactions per second on our main net. Um, and we do expect that number will, 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 will increase over the next year or two years as, as the tech underlying technology protocols is evolving um, from our research department. Um, then, you know, there are some more issues around privacy and how do you ensure permissions, right? And I'm not gonna go into to, to all these things, these are more how we handle that technology. I think that's, that's too far to go here, but I would like to illustrate how this technology can be used in, uh, in supply chains. So next slide, please. And I'll do that with, a, with, a, with an example. Oh, here, here's, um, uh, maybe I, I was too quick here, but this was just to, to show you, you know, one transaction comes in, reference to others, and, and we had this funny illustration of what that animal we call the tangle looks like. But let me go to the next slide um, and I can, I can, um, I'll talk you to this case. So we work at the moment in East Africa with, some, with governments in East Africa, especially in Kenya, with a startup and trademark East Africa, um, which is a, a, a trade organization. Um, what we do is we're building what we call a trade logistics information pipeline to help trade facilitation across borders. And the whole idea of this is that, that 
traders can start to share data and receive data for government institutions and border agencies. So if you need to obtain export certificates, certificates of origin, phytosanitary certificates, and so on, this system will allow traders to share status on these consignments with, with their logistics providers for better coordination. It will allow them when, when the when the goods arrive at the destination market overseas, let's get say in, in Holland, you know, customs can access the original certificates in a digital format uh, and, and, and early on receive them in a, in a digital format um, and, and ensure that these are the authentic uh, data. So we, what we are, we are the pilot phase with them is that we are testing how this will work uh, for, for, for flowers. Um, and, uh, and the way we actually started out this project is that we, we brought all the different stakeholders into a room from, you know, from the producers of flowers, the, the logistics providers, the different border agencies. And, and we simply said, you know, we give you, <laughs> we, we close you into this room until you get out and you, you agree on, on what would it look like if the supply chain was managed like it was one organization. Um, and, um, and we agreed on, on some design principles. And uh, maybe take next slide. Um, these, uh, these things where, you know, it has to enable time saving. It has to make everybody be able to see the, 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 the single version of truth, what happens to a consignment. Uh, we call it one truth visible, but only if you have the permission on this consignment, you know, so it is, it's only consignments that is relevant for you as a producer or, 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 or a logistic company to, to value. It, uh, it has to accommodate current infrastructure. So not building a whole new thing, just having a transactions layer on top, whereby you use this technology to make sure that when data is exchanged, it's, it's accounted for, it's immutable. Um, and then it has to be, we call it own collectively, but we have to find a way and we haven't solved that governance wise. These are the big discussions. The government will, will the Kenyan government will probably take ownership of this, but make sure that, that this is not a centralized platform owned by one organization because it has to be trusted by all entities to, to use it. And therefore you have, you need this decentralized uh, approach to, to trust in it uh, so you don't have one central entity with all the data um, and, and ability to access. So, so you can only access the data if you get the right from the people who put the data into the legend. That's a very, very important different way of working than with centralized databases where there is a central point that I have all the data. Um, so we are very excited to also enhance this uh, work and systems with, with the Zebra technologies, and and we're working with IBCS Group on testing what we will we we pilotly call trade facilitation by a scan. In other words, how can you use the existing infrastructure um, that 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 uh, that the, the the RFID scanners and barcode scanners and readers and so on, you know, are, are that are out there to automate these events and clearings um, and provide board agencies or potentially customs easy access to, to these consignments. Um, I think we have a, a 90 second. We want to show a little video of what stakeholders think about this. Maybe next slide. Hank. Yeah, I think it should start up. So let's just take 90 seconds and give you an idea of how people are reacting. Kenya is one of the biggest exporting countries of flowers in Africa. As of 2019, an estimate of 180,000 tons were exported from Kenya, and this roughly translates to an average of 7 million steps a day. When you look at the flower business, it is highly interconnected, and flowers must be at the right place at the right time. Any small delays along the supply chain means that everything can just go wrong. Currently, for our members, for them to export a single shipment from uh, their farm to their customer, they have to experience or go through an average of 200 different types of communications. So this includes phone calls, emails, uh, commercial invoices, certificates, and which is really, really uh, a challenge. We want to make it simple for businesses to actually trade better so that they focus on their core business. So if it's a flower farm, 
their core business is to grow flowers and sell the flowers uh, and therefore make the entire pipeline work for them to ensure that the flower or the fruit gets to the market in the shortest time possible. TLIP stands for the Trade Logistics Information Pipeline. This is our concept that we've worked together with stakeholders in the region. So this would be uh, private sector stakeholders and uh, government stakeholders to come up with a Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think it was just to give you a little taste of this uh, and, um, and you can find the full video if you search uh, trademark and, and IOTA. Um, but I'll hand over to, to Alex uh, and explain a little bit more about how it works with, with Zebra and which we're very excited to work with and, and make this technology available through. Thanks. Great, thanks Jens. Uh, so what I'm going to do is uh, talk through a bit about what Zebra Savannah is and what our data services platform is, uh, how we are working with uh, the blockchain and specifically with IOTA, uh, and then also about how you can actually access these data services. Uh, so just to begin with, Zebra Savannah is uh, a data service platform uh, based in the cloud, so effectively allows you to access these data services through cloud-based uh, REST APIs. And again, I'll show you later on uh, about how you can access those, those APIs. And really the foundation is, as you can see on the left there, this is a big part of Zebra's strategy around the fact that our core business uh, entails millions of devices out in the world today, including printers, enterprise mobile computers, RFID readers, scanners, et cetera. And what we're doing is enabling our partners and ISVs, and in some cases our end users, to gain access to the data from those devices or about those devices through these APIs. And you can see there in the middle that we have a number of examples that I'll go through in a bit more detail about specific APIs that we have available, including, as you can see towards the bottom, our blockchain traceability API. And ultimately, as I mentioned on the top right there, this is for our partners and ISVs and wider community to access. This is what the Zebra Data Services platform is for. In some cases, we are actually using these APIs internally. So you can see that uh, a couple of our solutions mentioned, SmartPack and MotionWorks, these solutions are built off of Savannah and using these data services that we are also exposing externally. So if we jump to the next slide, let's dive in a bit more to the topic of the webinar, which is the blockchain. So we have a data service called Blockchain Traceability. If you just tap again, Kush will get the whole animation up. Uh, and what this is designed to do is through Zebra Savannah, through our data service platform, provide the uh, access and the ability for an ISV or partner to send a RFID read or a print job uh, active, uh, you know, event or a scan to the blockchain in one API call. So as you can see, it's illustrated on the right there and we'll show you the API uh, in a couple of seconds, but it's designed to, like it says there, out of the box blockchain traceability and the ability to build your own blockchain solution effectively out of the box in a very, very simple way. Uh, on the left there is a few examples of use cases. I won't go into these too much because Jens did a great job talking about what is the use cases around blockchain, why use the blockchain instead of uh, you know, standard sto data storage mechanism. But we're seeing some really interesting projects, one of which is the trademark project that Jens talked about, in things like uh, providing compliance for uh, industry-wide mandates, and that might be something that's dictated by a local government, but it might be something that a private enterprise has just taken on themselves to um, provide that level of visibility and compliance within their own supply chain. Um, the automatically, the automated uh, recording of re and retrieving of events is really what this API is built to do. If you dive deeper into the API, which you can do after this webinar, you will see that you can record a scan or an RFID read or a print job 
to the blockchain through a REST API call. And then you can also retrieve an event from, or a list of events from the blockchain in another REST API call. So really it's as simple as that. If you are a developer, you will have experience, I'm sure, of working with REST APIs. Um, it really is one call to an API, which can be even automated from an application. So that really it's zero human touch to be able to record and retrieve uh, events from the blockchain. And we have various examples and, uh, you know, obviously the ability is there to be able to print, scan or read RFID tags um, using this API. So if we jump on to the next uh, slide here, really when we talk about um, you know, supply chain and registering events in the supply chain, if you jump to the whole animation, Kush, um, you know, the, the primary, primary uh, recording of an event in the supply chain today is the scan. So you scan an item and then it records that uh, event and then it probably stores that in a database somewhere. With our uh, blockchain API, we can uh, allow you to have a sort of digital twin of that event, um, of that scan event. But more increasingly, and this is probably a more exciting area uh, in terms of emerging technologies, uh, in a similar way to how a scan may enable you to store an event that, you know, where an item has moved to a certain position, for example, in the supply chain or moved from an agent to another agent. Um, for when, it's, when we're talking about RFID, RFID really is zero touch. You know, you are not having to, if it's a fixed RFID reader, you're not having to perform an action. There's no human intervention in order to register that something has happened, whether it's moving to a different agent or moving location, whatever, um, to a database. So this is why um, the RFID component of our blockchain offering is really, really exciting because of that complete zero touch aspect of RFID. And we are already very prominent in RFID. We are uh, the leader in the magic quadrant for location solutions. Um, and with RFID, we are already working on, like you can see here, an API on Savannah so that you can read RFID tags directly from the reader. Um, you can send those uh, activities and that data to uh, a cloud system or on-premise system, whatever, through the REST API. Um, but where we see uh, a really exciting aspect is not just doing RFID reads to cloud like we are making available on Savannah, but RFID read to blockchain. And if we jump to the next slide, now we can start getting into our partnership with IOTA. So what we have built with IOTA uh, and what we've been working on for a number of weeks um, with IOTA, and we've accelerated this pretty quickly, is um, now out of the box on our Zebra Savannah site, you are able to record an RFID transaction or an event, we should say, um, directly to IOTA's Tangle that Jens talked about before through one REST API call. So as you can see here on the left there, this is a basic demonstration of um, the person there where, uh, you know, holding the box and they move the box across the antenna and that antenna is connected to an, a fixed RFID reader uh, in that same room. And as you can see when it jumps up on the IOTA screen there, when the box passes the antenna, it records a transaction. And then you can see a visualization on the right there. It records that transaction onto the IOTA Tangle. And then we have another part of that API, which enables someone to retrieve that list of transactions, uh, which has all been stored on the Tangle DLT. And this use case really speaks to what uh, Jens was talking about earlier, which is the fact that you know, one of the big benefits of blockchain is the consistency of information and the fact that anyone can come in and access it and there is a complete level of trust that there has been no manipulation of that data. And when it comes to RFID, the fact that you know, there is no scan involved, there is no human intervention really to get that data onto the tangle, this is complete zero touch um, uh, compliance um, within a supply chain. So it's very, very exciting, the use cases that this could open up. This is very, very new. We, up, we built uh, the API here in our sandbox, I think two weeks ago. And if we jump to the next slide, 
this is something that um, you can go out and test today. And we would very much like you to test today and give us some feedback. So all you need to do the testing is an RFID reader, uh, which you can get, and we'll talk about this a bit more um, as part of, if you are part of our ISV program or if you're part of our partner program. So all you need to do is get uh, a reader, then um, register on our developer portal, and I will provide the link in a second to that. And once you've registered and you have a reader, then you can go on to the developer portal and you can find this API in the sandbox and you can start posting data and retrieving data onto the IOTA Tangle. We'd be very much be interested to um, get your feedback on the testing, very much interested to see your use cases that you're thinking about and you're building out. We believe this is a very, very hot topic in, um, in Africa um, for various reasons. One of the first projects, as Jens talked about, is in Kenya with Trademark. Um, but you know, this, a lot of the origins of the supply chain are in Africa. So we'd be very excited to see some use cases built out with this API. So if we jump to the next slide, um, to find the API, uh, all you have to do is just go on to our developer portal. So if you just type into Google developer.zebra.com slash APIs, this is actually an old um, image, but if you go on to platforms, uh, you will see Zebra Data Services, not Savannah Data Services. Um, go into there and then you'll see, as you can see on the top tab there, Sandbox. Go down to Prototypes and you'll find the IOTA uh, Zebra API. So, of course, this is very much targeted at uh, developers. So, if you have either internal developers or you work with um, a software partner, then they should be very comfortable working with REST APIs. We'd also be very interested in the feedback on the user experience of the dev portal and the API itself. Um, so you can go on there, register, and you can start testing the API today. There is no cost to test the API. So you get a number of free calls for testing. Um, so yeah, I encourage you to go on and certainly give us feedback. And if we jump onto the next slide, just to finish off um, on the, on the Zebra Savannah side, Zebra Data Services side, uh, the blockchain API, um, we actually have one, a blockchain API on the main API page. That you'll see that's actually um, going through some updates at the moment, so you probably can't access that. The IOTA API is in the sandbox, okay? Um, and you know this forms part of our wider uh, portfolio of APIs and data services. So uh, you can see on the left there, we have various APIs for our devices. So if you're building software for Zebra devices, um, such as, for example, on the enterprise mobile computer side, if you're building software to manage those devices or pull data from those devices, then the device health API would be very appropriate for, your, um, for building out your solution. Then we have our RFID read to cloud API, which I talked about earlier, which allows you to access uh, RFID data directly from the reader through our cloud-based REST API. And then finally, we are releasing a, an API for our printer portfolio, our Link OS printers uh, next quarter. And then on the right there, we have our value add APIs, which do not depend on a Zebra device. So this is pulling or, or interacting um, from the application layer to, uh, to the REST API, not uh, from the device itself. So we have APIs around uh, generating barcodes, around uh, looking into uh, databases, which Zebra do not own, but we are providing access to that database effectively through this cloud-based uh, API. For example, we have access to the UPC database, um, the FDA recall database. Um, so you can access uh, that through that API. And then finally, we have our blockchain API, which we are expanding out with this partnership with IOTA. So with that, um, again, providing or accessing these APIs and data services is a whole lot easier when you are part of our ISV program. So I'm gonna pass it over to Marco now to talk through that. Thank you very much, Alex. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Marco Politi, and I'm the person in charge of the ISV program uh, across South uh, EMEA. Okay. So today, uh, I would like to give you a quick overview about our program. So 
uh, first of all, we strongly uh, believe uh, on our uh, ISP community. So actually, uh, we created um, a, a program, okay, uh, uh, which is called ISB program. Okay, so we uh, we believe and we we think uh, that our uh, ISB community is very important to us. So we would like to work more uh, with with you guys uh, if you are ISBs. Um, so uh, let me uh, just introduce our uh, our ISB program. Uh, so. Uh, it's important to say that uh, if you guys are involved in some opportunities, okay, uh, uh, you, sh you should or you could uh, register those opportunities uh, on our uh, uh, partner gateway, okay, so our virtual uh, portal. Uh, in this way, uh, you could be eligible uh, to get uh, a reward, okay, an economic reward if we are able to close uh, that opportunity, okay? So basically, uh, uh, you can uh, influence or recommend uh, Zebra products uh, and you could be eligible um, uh, for, uh, for a reward. Um, uh, um, Ankush, back uh, to, to, to my slide, please. Okay, thank you. Um, um, so basically, in this case, it's not about reselling, it's just about influencing or, or recommending our, our product. So uh, I'll, I encourage you uh, to start submitting influence registration and start sharing a project with us in order to be eligible for, for an economic reward. Okay, so this is the, the first point and it's one of the most important ones. Um, uh, another important thing is the fact that you guys can test and certify uh, your application. Okay, so if you own an application and you develop application, uh, you can test them and you can cert officially certify them with us. Okay, so we have two different programs, uh, the compatible one and the validated one, and you uh, can get visibility from this certification and you can show this certification to your uh, potential customers, okay? Um, so uh, another important uh, thing is the fact that you can uh, also be eligible to get uh, free terminals, okay? What does it mean? It means that if you share opportunities with us through the influence registration section, um, every three um, uh, influence registration, every three project uh, share with us, you are eligible to get uh, one uh, terminal, any kind of terminal. It could be a printer, it could be um, a mobile computing device or, or a scanner, okay? So um, these are the main uh, benefits of uh, being an ISP with, with Zebra, okay? There are a lot of things uh, uh, that I would like to, uh, to share with you. So please, uh, uh, if you are uh, interested in getting more information, uh, feel free to reach me out, okay? So Nicolas, uh, over to you again. Thank you very much, Marco, and uh, thank you to the team. I think some great insights. Um, I'm, I'm very excited about blockchain, especially through um, um, traceability through supply chain. Um, so yeah, thanks, thanks, thanks a lot. Um, I think we've come to the end of the presentation today. Um, we're going to go over to Q and A's now. Um, but before I do, just um, uh, a big thank you again to our, to our speakers, both Alex Jens and Marco, uh, for taking the time to come and speak to our community. Um, uh, I think it was very valuable. So again, thanks, thanks a lot to you guys. Um, so let's go over to Q and A. Um, I see there's already been a question from uh, uh, Venice. Um, I think I'll uh, ask this over to Alex. Uh, Alex, the question is: um, I would like to know how to ensure the integrity of the data being entered by the user. Sure. So I'll, um, I'll give my take on this and then I'll uh, also hand it to Jens to, um, to let him answer. So <laughs> when, when we talk about, um, you know, specifically how we've set up our blockchain API, 
uh, really the the application is the is the gateway to recording the data uh, the application sends that data through our API to the blockchain so how that blockchain and uh, the blockchain and that front uh, end user interface is set up is really how that integrity uh, and access is controlled when we talk about RFID um, you know RFID is typically like I was saying designed to be there is no human intervention it is the reader sending the data directly through Savannah um, you know, recording it on the blockchain um, and that is it there is no human intervention so it's much easier from that perspective to avoid any manipulation of the data I'll also hand it yeah like I said to Jens to give his take yeah, thanks, Alex. And of course, I second what you're saying. But I think maybe this is also the principle which we call crab in, crab out, meaning that, you know, whoever puts the data in and they put some strange data in there, I mean, that's that's nothing that that that, that, that either zebra or the blockchain can 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 work against, right? But 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 the crab will stay there, <laughs> so to say, um, because because we have this data integrity, so. So we are back to we are back to the same we're back to the accountability here that that whoever put this in we would know who did that um, and and they will be accountable for 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 that kind of of wrongful data or if that is used let's say it's used for trade finances purposes or, or whatever it's used for um, so so of course we can't do anything about that uh, part of the the, the 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 data journey but once it's it's recorded uh and it's immediately uploaded uh to the to the tangle well it will it will stay the data integrity will stay from there on and out and uh, and uh, and if you have if you encrypt it as well um you can also decide who is allowed to 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 see it i hope that answers your question i mean the um Shall I also take the next question? How we work with these one standards and one yes, 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 please do. So, um, first of all, in principle, um, the IOTA Tangle is 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 just a, a, a low level protocol. That means that you can put any kind of data that you like. I would say this question relates to what I would call, you know, a second layer on top of that, and that is the data standards if you have a decided data standards within your 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 ecosystem um which you know the ds1 standards uh would would certainly be uh for 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 location um you would agree that you would put these standards in right you put that data in and uh, and and there's no hindrance from our side um what data you put in uh, any any transaction can, in principle, include one kilobyte of data. But if you need more, we just put transactions together, and the system will do that automatically to some some software layers. So you know whether it's GS one or one world uh, data. Um, I but what I think is, and we have had discussions with GS one, and we in early days with that, is that you can actually you could actually make this works much more easier and then you don't need data towers that are centrally stored but you could use decentralized ways of, of of doing that using these standards so it's a very exciting thing this question opens up to um yeah and just uh, yeah. yeah just to add to that Jens. yeah um the way that we've set up our uh data service on on savannah with iota is you know there's just a sort of free flow json body in in the api so you can add uh basically what whatever data you choose to record um so it could be yeah the epc um data point or the event or the type or the timestamp or even just a free flow um uh, bit of data so you know in that sense it's totally flexible to whatever framework the user is using to record if it's an rfid read or a scan or whatever okay great thank you um it doesn't look like there's any more questions um but yeah thanks uh, for those questions and uh, again a thanks to the team and the panel um i think we can uh, end off the presentation now um so we will give five minutes back to, to everybody so thanks again for everybody that joined the webinar and uh as mentioned if you have any questions with regards to the blockchain 
um, or anything that you've seen in the presentation, please uh, reach out to us and uh, we'll be very happy to assist. Thank you.